Thank you for being with us this morning. Believe in God for great things in your life. My name is Pastor Matt. I'm the pastor here at Destiny Church and just want to welcome you here. So glad that you're here with us on February the 18th, 2018. No place I'd rather be than right here at Destiny Church. And so, so thankful that you're here uh, to worship the Lord together. This morning we're continuing our series called Live Like Jesus. Uh, in this series we're learning how to... Live like Jesus, trying to make it real simple for us today. Uh, this, as we go through this series, what we're doing is we're taking the book of James, and we're taking it and we're going verse by verse, learning how we, me, you, and I, we can live like Jesus. James was Jesus' younger half-brother, and he saw Jesus grow up. He saw the way he lived his life. He eventually saw him crucified for the sins of the world and risen to new life. James ended up worshiping Jesus as God, and he writes this letter encouraging Christians everywhere to live the way that Jesus lived his life. As Christians, that should be our aim and goal, to live like Jesus. And so last week we saw that sometimes life is hard. How many of you would say, I agree with that statement? Sometimes life is hard. Sometimes there are trials in life and tests in life, but we, like Jesus, can face our trials and tests with joy because God is in control. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so uh, last week we saw that we can live joyfully even in the midst of trials because God uses the trial and he uses the test to grow us, to perfect us, to help us to be more mature. Also, we saw that in the moment of trial that we can call on God for wisdom and that God will give his wisdom to us in the midst of the trial. How many of you prayed and asked God for some wisdom this week? Amen. Man, more of us need to be doing that. I prayed this week, God, I need wisdom. Show me what to do. Give me the words to speak. And the promise of God is that he will give us his wisdom. What great and glorious good news. This morning as we get to verse 12 where we will start, um, James is continuing this theme about talking about trials. But I want to ask you this question before we get to the passage. How many of you want to be blessed today? Oh, I want to be. Don't you want to be blessed by God? Don't you want to live a life full of God's blessing and his joy and his provision in your life? Amen. Amen. Well, I've got good news for you. God wants that too. God wants you to be blessed and full of joy and walking in his provision each and every day. And James, when he writes this passage that we're going to see today, he starts with another key to living and walking in the blessing of God. And so, since we want to be blessed, I know that this is the right passage for us this morning. Verse 12, blessed is the man, how many of you want to be blessed? I do, I do, I do. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. How many of you love God today? Amen. You love God? You love God? Now, how many of you have faced a test? You've faced a trial before. Amen? Have, have you ever not stood the test in the, in the midst of the trial? Anybody? Anybody? Any honest people here today? Only a few honest people. Well, you just failed the test, so. Um, no, but God, here, here, here is the deal. There is a blessing for you if you will remain faithful through the trials of this life. There is a blessing for you. This word steadfast is this word faithful. It, it's one step in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. No matter what comes my way, I'm not throwing my back on God. I'm not turning my back on God. I'm not throwing in the towel on my faith. I am being faithful. I am being steadfast. 
And if that is you, this verse tells you that there is a great blessing for you that you can anticipate. James calls it the crown of life. Eternal life. That's kind of a big blessing, right? Life eternal. You know, Jesus says that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but he came to give us life and life abundantly. This eternal life, this abundant life, this crown of life, it is for you if you will stand the test, if you will pass through the trials steadfast. But here's what I want you to see. He says that if you will stand the test, there will be the, the, the crown of life, but that God has promised to give that crown of life, eternal life, to everyone who loves him. It is your love for God that enables you to live for God. Here's the deal. God has promised, if you love me, you will have eternal life, the crown of life. It is my promise to you if you love me. James says, if you pass the test and if you make it through the trial, if you live faithfully and steadfastly, you'll get the crown of life. Well, which is it? Well, it's both. But here's the promise. If you love God, you're going to make it through the test. If you love God, if you really love Him, you will live for Him. You will be faithful to Him. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, live faithfully for me. Now, if you love someone, guess what? You'll be faithful to them. Amen? I cannot say I love my wife if I am unfaithful to her. Right? You would call me a liar or worse. I can't say I love my wife if I never serve my wife. If I never sacrifice for her or put her before me. Amen? Love is not an emotion. Love is not a feeling. Love is not those butterflies that... We got when we were in third grade. Love is a decision. Love is a commitment. Love is action. If I don't ever live for my wife, if my life does not back up my words, then my words are worthless. So if you, I ask you, I say, do you love God? You say yes. But do you live for God? I hope you would say yes. What that love for God means is that he's number one. He's numero uno, right? He's el jefe. He's on the top of the list. Amen? I need to learn more Spanish. I'll get more applause. All right. What does it mean to love God? It means I put him first. It means I'm willing to give, I'm willing to serve Him, I'm willing to sacrifice for Him. When we look at God's love for us, that's our example. Does He not give? Does He not serve? Does He not bless? Does He not sacrifice for us? Yes, of course He does. Love is action. Amen. So we've learned about tests, we've learned about trials, but now James is going to start talking about another T word that we don't like, but we all need to learn how to deal with and to face. And that is temptation. Can you say temptation? Temptation. temptation. I'm going to ask you a question. I do not want you to answer out loud. I just want you to think about it. Where does temptation come from? Where does temptation come from? What is the source of temptation? Now, temptation, we know if we act on temptation, it will lead us into sin. And we do not want to enter into sin. We do not want to live in sin. But it is not a sin to be tempted. We've see, we see in the Gospels that Jesus, who was without sin, was tempted, yet without sin, because he didn't act on the temptation. But what is the source of temptation? If we're going to fight temptation, if we're going to battle against temptation in our life and be victorious, which I believe God has called us to be, we need to understand it, we need to know how it works, and we need to know what the source is. Where does it come from? James says here in verse 13, he tells us where temptation does not come from. James says, let no one say when he is tempted, 
I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, God tempted me? You haven't? Well, you got to sit in my office. You hear some crazy things. You've never heard somebody say, well, I sinned, but God is sovereign, and so he makes me do whatever I, I even if I didn't want to do it, he made me do it. You, okay, well, there's some people that think that way. Because God is sovereign, he must have tempted me that I fell into this temptation. This verse says, no, God is not tempting you. He didn't make you do it. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he says, God will not allow you to face a temptation that is beyond your ability to withstand it. So not only is God not bringing temptation into your life, he's standing between you and temptations that are too strong for you. And so if you are being tempted today, it means that God knows that you have the ability and the strength to overcome it. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability to overcome that temptation. He's not bringing temptation into your life. In fact, he's keeping the temptations that are too strong for you, that he knows you couldn't resist. He's keeping them away from you. Wow, isn't God good? Additionally, that verse goes on to say, but when you are tempted, God is faithful. Everybody say, God is faithful. God is faithful to provide a way of escape for you in the midst of your temptation. In every temptation, there is a way of escape because God is faithful. If this building today were to catch on fire, you know what I hope you would do? I hope you would start looking for the illuminated signs that say exit. I hope you wouldn't just say, well, I guess today's my day to meet the Lord. I'm just going to sit here and burn up with this building. No, you wouldn't. You'd say, how do I get out of here? Where is the emergency exit? How, where is my way of escape? And what James is saying and what Paul is saying is that temptation is like a burning house. But God has placed exit signs for you. And in the midst of your temptation, you can say, God, show me the way out. And it's there. When you feel the temptation, you need to start looking because God is faithful. There is a way out for you in the midst of your temptation. You do not have to enter into sin. So if temptation doesn't come from God, just think to yourself, don't say it out loud. But, okay, temptation does not come from God. Where does it come from? Where does temptation come from? Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. And James does too, and he's going to surprise you this morning. Verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Now, some uh, some of you are thinking, well, it's the devil. How many of you ever heard the devil made me do it? Anybody ever heard that? Yeah, right. More people have heard that one. I rebuke you, Satan, and the devil's tempting me. Well, what does James say? Hold on, what does he say? Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived. Now Jesus put it this way in Mark chapter 7. He said this, for from within, out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. How many of you have something you did this week on that list? Okay. Right. All these things come from within, Jesus says, and they defile a person. Temptation is not an external problem. It is an internal problem. 
We need to identify the source of temptation, which is in our fallen human nature and evil desires. Now, I'm not saying that Satan doesn't get involved in that. We see in the Gospels that he came and that he tempted Jesus, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So he's involved in that, but the material, uh, Satan has a lot of material to work with, which is our own evil desires, as Jesus says. So the problem with humanity, the problem of sin, it is the human heart. We have broken hearts, we have broken desires, we desire to do things that would lead us into sin and ultimately lead us to death. Jesus is the only answer for the sin problem. He's the only answer for our broken hearts. You see, our hearts do not function, our desires do not function the way God designed them or the way God intended them, but because we have allowed sin to come in, it has distorted and polluted our desires. Now, all desires are not evil. And our, our base desires, what we desire, just our basic desires at the core of who we are, they're, they're not bad. In fact, they're put there by God. How many of you, after church today, you're going to be hungry? Amen. And so what are you going to go do? You're going to eat some food, right? And your hunger is, is God's way. He put that desire there. Because if you don't eat, eventually you will die, right? So it's your body's way of saying, hey, I need food. Hey, I need nourishment. Um, my kids love watching this movie, Nacho Libre. How many of you have ever seen that? <laughs> what Nacho Libre would say, it's your body's way of saying how your body needs the nutrients, right? I need those nutrients. Anyway, my kids would laugh at that. Um, maybe I should be teaching Sunday school. Okay. But it, 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 it's not evil to go and eat lunch. Right? That is a God-given desire. Now, can I satisfy that desire in a sinful way? Well, I know we're in San Antonio. Let me say it again. Can I satisfy that desire for hunger in an ungodly way? Yes. yes I know it's the conviction of the Lord falling on this place right now. Listen, I can eat so much, I can gorge myself, what the Bible calls the sin of gluttony. We don't hear a lot of messages on that. Um, but I can, I can try to fill the void of my emotions or, or wounds of the past. I can try to satisfy that with food. That's not, you know, Jesus being number one. That's, you know, enchiladas being number one. Um... I could lead my hunger, lead me to steal, right? If I steal my food, it leads me into sin, or I kill somebody for food, right? So there, there's ways that we can satisfy our God-given appetites that he has prescribed and that are good and that are holy, that he has blessed. There are other ways, sinful ways, and that's what James is talking about, these desires trying to satisfy what God, the appetites God has given us in an ungodly way. Sexual intimacy is another. God created sex. He made man and woman. He created the genders, male and female. He created them. Genesis chapter 2. He brings Adam and Eve together. He marries them. He, he brings them together in sexual union, sexual intimacy. The two become one flesh. And God looks at that and he smiles and he says, that is very good. And he pronounces a blessing upon that. And so we all have a, a sexual desires. We all have an urge to, for intimacy. But I can satisfy that in a godly way, the way God has shown us in his word, or I can satisfy it in an ungodly way, which is any other way other than what God has prescribed. So that's what James is talking about. He, he's talking about not our base level desires, but our desires that have been influenced by our sin nature and that lead us away from what God has designed and intended for us. Now, we must not make our desires our God. 
We, we must not put my desires over the place of God in my life. I am to be in control of my desires. Thank you, one person. <laughs> I am to exercise my will over my desires. You cannot become a slave to what you desire. Your desires are not in control of you. You must be in control of them. And here's what you do with your desires. Here's how you exercise your will. You yield your will to the word of God. You yield your desires to God. You don't yield your will to your base desires. You yield your will to the word of God. You say, God... I'm choosing to trust in you. All of us have things that we want to do that are sinful. And if we act upon them, we enter into sin, ultimately producing death in our lives. But I can yield that to God and say, God, I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting in you. I'm yielding to you my desires. David wrote in the Psalms uh, 37 verse 4, Many of you know this verse. He said, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, some of you take that as a blank check and just say, well, if I make God number one in my life, then he has to give me whatever I want in my heart. And that is not what that verse is saying. You see, if you truly delight in the Lord, if he is your source of joy in your life, and that's what that means, that he's in that first place, he's in that place of preeminence, occupying that space of attention, of joy. You delight in him, you delight in his word. That if you do that, you know what's going to happen? God's going to transform your heart. You're going to become more like him. You're going to begin to desire the things that he desires. If you delight in the Lord, he will put into you new desires. He will give you new desires in your heart. How many of you have experienced that, right? Like when you, before you were a Christian, man, you had some desires. And that you enjoyed them and they were fun. And wow, I'm breaking all Ten Commandments at the same time. This is amazing, right? But then you got saved. And all of a sudden, what brought you joy, man, it didn't bring you joy anymore. The things you thought were fun, man, it just... It made you sick. Why? Because God put a new desire in you. God replaced your heart. He put a new heart in you. And if we will delight ourselves in the Lord, what you will find over time is that your desires will be transformed, that he will put into your heart new desires. But if I make my desires my God, you know what I'm going to be? I'm going to be a slave. I'm going to be a slave. And I, I'm called to be a son of God, not a slave to sin. Can I get an amen? At this? Yeah. Now, the other thing I want to talk about, we talked about desire. I also want to talk about deception. Here, James uses the terminology of lured away or enticed. So I went and got myself one of these things here. All the ladies are like, what is that? Um, maybe that was a stupid thing to say. Anyway. This is a lure. This is a fishing lure. Do I have any fishermen in the house? Do I have any hunters in the house? Okay. Listen, to catch the, something, you have to use the right bait. You know that, right? And that's what this is. This is bait. And it is attractive to a fish, okay? So a fish would look at this and say, wow. That's attractive. I could, I need to get me some of that yellow thing. And this thing is, it's made to get your attention or the fish's attention. And it dangles and it makes noise. And, you know, it, it, it kind of reminds me of some other things, men, that is made to get your attention. Right? 
Hello? It distracts you. Wow, look at that. I mean, the billboards around town, you know, it's just, psh, your, your mind is being assaulted constantly by temptation. But here's the deal with bait. It never satisfies. Ever. Am I right, sportsmen in the house? Bait never satisfies, and it is always a trap. Temptation is always a trap. It is a trap. It is a trap. It is a trap. Now, funny thing is, you see these little dangling things here, this little yellow stuff? Do you know what that's called? That's, any of the men know what that's called? It's called a skirt. I'm not making this up. But you know what's hiding under the skirt? Oh, man, death. There is death under the skirt. That is what is under the skirt. It is a trap. James is saying, do not be lured away by something that on the outside promises so much. It's flashy, it's sexy, it's exciting, it's enticing, it's promising you to satisfy your desire, but in the end, you're hooked. In the end, you're dead. In the end, you're lunch, okay? <laughs> Bait never satisfies. And, and it, the lure, the enticement, the bait, it's a distraction. It, it, you know, if you just stuck a hook down there, no fish would go bite it. They're stupid, but they're not that stupid. You got to put something on the hook to say, come this way, come this way. And that's all temptation is. The devil's not going to show up to you and say, hey, do you want to ruin your marriage? Hey, do you want to destroy your life? Hey, do you want to end up burning in hell for all eternity? I've got something great for you. It's called death. Anybody want some? No, that's not the way it works. There's a distraction around it, and it blinds us in our flesh from being able to see that underneath is a hook. Beyond it is death. And we all know this. We know this. Nobody in here would ever say, well, I'm so glad I sinned that one time. It worked out so well for me. It, it, it doesn't work that way. There's nobody in here who's a Christian who would say, that one time I sinned, it just was awesome. No, you know it produces death. You know it produces brokenness. You know it produces shame. You understand that. But the temptation, the lure, the distraction, it, it lies to you. That's why he says, don't be deceived. It's a lie. It's a trap. Thank the Lord he provides for us that way of escape. Amen. Because ultimately, ultimately, James tells us what happens to sin. If we allow sin to go unchecked in our lives, it's going to grow. If you're nurturing sin, it ends up becoming a full-grown man, and that full-grown man is called death. Death. Now, ultimately, we know that apart from Christ, our sin will produce eternal death. And death, what is death? Death is the, the separation or the, the, the removal of life. That is what death is. Death is the amp absence of life. And the only source of life is God himself. Yeah. And if I continue in sin and harden my heart against God and reject his, his payment for my sin and re refuse Christ and his sacrifice, if I do all of those things, this separation that my sin causes between me and God, it will eventually become permanent and final. Yep. And I will, be, I will experience death for all eternity separation from God in torment with the devil. 
That is not a good plan for your life. I do not recommend that course. But we know for those of us who are Christians, we've put our faith in Jesus. Sin also produces death in our lives. How many of you have ever had a relationship die because of sin? I have. You've been sinned against. How many of you had a marriage fall apart because of sin? It died because of sin. I've lost relationships because of lies. I've lost relationships because of envy. I've lost relationships because of gossip. Right? Sin produces death. Marriages where the spouse is unfaithful, it introduces sin and death into the marriage. James says, do not be deceived. If you sow sin, you reap death. There's no little sin. It eventually grows up. So if I, I want to encourage you, don't, don't make a place in your life for gossip. Don't make a place in your life for envy. Don't make a place in your life for bitterness. Don't make a place in your life for pride. Uh, don't make a place in your life for lust, for pornography, for watching junk that you shouldn't be seeing. Listen, you, you invite that stuff into your life, and it looks so good. It looks so promising. It lies to you, and it says, this will satisfy you. But in the end, it's going to produce hurt, harm, brokenness, and death in your life. And I don't want that for you. And God doesn't want that for you. So he tells us. He gives us his word. Every sin is a deception. Do not be deceived. Now, one of the ways to overcome sin and to overcome temptation, this is one of the ways, is I look at eventually the judgment of God is going to come on my life. And I don't want that. I don't want death. So I'm not going to sin. That's one way to overcome temptation. The fear of the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. So that's a, that is a, a, a strategy that you can use when you're being tempted. If I enter into this at some level, it's going to produce death in my life. Now, he gives us another way, a second way. It's like a two-edged sword he gives us here uh, for how to combat temptation. And this, the second way might even be a better way. He says this in verse uh, 16. Again, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will... He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. So option one, in the midst of my temptation, I can look at death and what lies beyond the temptation. That's option one. Option two is I can remember the goodness of God. How good has God been to me? How much has that God blessed me? How gracious has he been to me in my life? That's another option. And see, Satan is a liar. Oh, he's a liar. And he wants to deceive you. That's why James says, don't be deceived. The lie of Satan is that God is not good, that God does not love you, that God does not want you to be blessed, that God is actually mad at you, and he's trying to keep good things from you. It is a lie. God is trying to keep death out of your life. The, 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 the word of God is like the guardrails on a dangerous highway. How many of you are really glad when you drive down the highway that there's a barrier between you and oncoming traffic? Amen? Now, I can drive in a straight line without that barrier there, but I'm really glad that it's there to keep me in case of just craziness happening in life. God's word is like that. It's a barrier. It keeps us from death. It's like, a, it's like the walls around a city. It protects us from, from death coming in. God's word keeps us 
Because God is good to us. He's not trying to keep good things from you. He's trying to keep death from entering into your life. So when God says, don't do this or don't do that or do this and do that, it's not because he's a mad guy. He just wants to keep you from having fun. He's trying to keep you from death. But we can't see it sometimes because we're just so enamored with the temptation. Remember, there is a hook on the end of that bait. Listen, God only gives good gifts. This says every good and perfect gift comes down from above. Have you ever had something good happen in your life? How about the day you were born? What a miracle. How about the day you were conceived? You know, you beat out like three other million people in a swimming race. It was amazing. It was incredible. You're a winner today. You won. A, you won. You're fast. You did it. Congratulations. That was a good day. The, the day you came into this earth, a great day. Every good thing that you've ever experienced in this life is a gift from God. That's what this verse says. How about the air you're breathing right now? What a good gift. What about that embrace from your child? Oh, how wonderful is that? What about intimacy with your spouse? How wonderful is that? <laughs> Three people. We need to do a seminar on spousal intimacy. I think it's good. All four times. Let me get back to the notes. God is good. Everything that is good that you experience in this life is from God. You know what I love doing on a hot summer day when it's 105 degrees and it's been in the hundreds for two weeks? I love driving down to Sonic and I get myself a cherry limeade, Route 44. It's bigger than my head. And I take a sip of that and oh, my whole head wants to explode. It's so good. Where did that come from? It came from God. Have you ever had... That's what this verse says. Every good and perfect gift. Have you ever had some beef fajitas that you just, they just melt in your mouth? Oh, they're so good and amazing. They're from God. Everything good in your life is from God. Everything. Everything. You made it to church without some bonehead on 1604 killing you. God is good today. You got to experience his presence in worship today. God is good. Oh my goodness, is God good to us? We don't deserve it. There's so much we don't deserve. All of the moments, think of all the birthdays and the celebrations and every little moment that we take for granted all the time and it's just God pouring out his goodness. God pouring out his goodness. God pouring out his grace on us. It says every good and perfect gift comes from God who, who is, is coming down. It's continuous. Not that it came down and that it stopped. It is continued. God is just the gift giver. Ever since he created humanity, he just continues to pour out these good things on us. That's why every time before we eat a meal in my family, we stop and we pause and we give thanks to God for what we're about to eat of. Because it's from God. Everything good in your life is a gift from God. When we go through life, we don't even acknowledge. We don't even acknowledge the miracles we live with in our modern society. We're so, we're so spoiled rotten. We're so spoiled rotten. We allow the devil to rob our joy. You know, we go to the gas station and it went up two cents. Ah, God. Like, that there's even a gas station that I can even, like, turn this magic key and get in this magic carpet ride vehicle that takes me wherever I want to go. It's crazy. Oh, two extra cents. What's the world coming to? Don't 
let the devil rob your joy. Look, God does not stop, but listen, he cannot stop giving. That's who he is. Why? Because God is love. And when you love someone, you give to them. God is just pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, pouring out because he loves us. He loves us. He loves us. He can't stop loving us. So he keeps pouring out his goodness on us. And then this verse tells us that God does not change. He doesn't change. So I don't have to wake up tomorrow and be like, oh my goodness, did God change? Am I, is he going to stop pouring out goodness on my life? Is the world going to run out of enchiladas? What is going to happen? No, God is not going to change. He's always been good. He'll always be good. He's always been a giver. He's always going to be a giver. So we can obey God out of fear, you know, eternal damnation, all that kind of stuff. And that works. Or we can obey God out of love. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Pick one. Pick both. But man, when I see how good God's been to me, I don't want to live in sin. When I see how he purchased eternal life for me, how he set me free, why do I want to go back to that? I don't serve God out of duty and drudgery and, oh, man, got to be joyful because the Bible says and got to love my wife because the Bible says and got to discipline my kids and can't go get drunk tonight because the Bible says you know, living for Jesus, it's the cross I bear. Man, there is, there is such a, there's a higher plane of living. You can live above all of that. You can live beyond all of that. You can live in joy and blessing. He finishes, James does, by telling us about the ultimate gift, the greatest gift, salvation. He says that God has caused us to be reborn. He's brought us forth is what he's saying. Jesus says, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about this greatest gift that God has given to the world. Because God loved the world so much. Because God loved me and you so much. He gave his only son, Jesus. So that Jesus would live the life I couldn't live. That Jesus would die the death that I deserved. Oh, man. To pay the price for my sin. Because God loved me so much. That Jesus would rise in victory on that third day. Having defeated Satan and sin, and death, and the grave. And that whoever would believe in him, whoever would turn from their sin and trust in Jesus could have that eternal life. Oh, isn't God a good gift giver? Salvation is the ultimate gift. James says God has brought us forth. He's given us new life of his own will. Salvation was God's idea. It wasn't your idea. Jesus came looking for you before you were ever looking for him. If you're here today, I want you to know Jesus is calling out your name. He's saying, come to me, turn to me, follow me. I'll give you new life. I'll give you forgiveness of sins. I'll set you free from sin. I'll set you free from death today. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ. I didn't cause myself to be born naturally. I don't cause myself to be reborn spiritually. It is a work of the Holy Spirit working with the Word of God. He says we were brought forth by His own will and the Word of God. As the Word of God goes out, it produces faith within our hearts. And the Spirit of God comes and He convicts us of our sin. He empowers us to turn from our sin and to trust in Jesus. This verse tells us, this passage is showing us that the problem is not out there. The problem is right here. That it's our own heart that is the problem. But the good news is that Jesus can give you a new heart today. He can take your old heart, distorted, disruptive, dying because of sin, and he comes and he gives you his heart, 
his spirit gives you new desires. Your life might not change in a day, but let me tell you, your life will change if you trust in Jesus. As that new heart, you live out of those new desires and you pursue Jesus. Only Jesus can give us a new heart. Only Jesus can heal our souls.